Joining me now is Matt Verderan. Thanks so much for being with me once again, Matt. I know we've had you on the show a couple of times, NFL writer for Fansided and also a Stacking the Box podcast. I know you write a column under the same headline. Welcome. Tell us where you are. Where are you coming to us from? From a hotel room in Mobile, Alabama. Got down here a few hours ago. I'm here for the week for the Senior Bowl before shipping off to Los Angeles for the Super Bowl. So a busy time, but an exciting time. What are you going to be uh, paying attention to there? I think like most people, the quarterbacks, you know, this is a year where there's not a quarterback that you look at and go, that guy's a number one pick. That guy's a top five choice. I think there's a lot of intrigue around who's going to separate themselves at that position. Um, and we're going to get a good look over the next three days, going to practice, watching guys throw, watching guys do different drills, uh, getting to talk to them after practice. So I'm interested to see if one of these quarterbacks starts to emerge as maybe the, the, the favorite of the class. Let's start with quarterbacks, since um, since that's kind of where we just landed. There's a lot to get to after uh, this weekend. Rumors around Tom Brady swirling. What does Aaron Rodgers' future hold? Where does Jimmy Garoppolo go? On and on and on. But as it relates to the Super Bowl matchup and the meeting between these two quarterbacks, uh, very different stories, as you write about for Fansided. You have... Joe Burrow, something of a hero in Cincinnati, this young kid that's so easy to root for, juxtaposed with a guy who's trying to get to the Super Bowl for, I think, maybe the 12th, 13th, 14th year now. I mean, what do you make of the quarterback matchup that we're going to see between Matthew Stafford and Joe Burrow? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Look, Joe Burrow comes to Cincinnati as the number one overall pick, and people forget now. It seems like ancient history. There's a lot of talk as to whether or not, you know, should he try to force his way out? They're a losing franchise. Should he, should he basically go the Eli Manning route and say, I'm not going to play there? He took the challenge as an Ohio kid, um, and, and he has obviously passed it with flying colors. But look, I think it's just a really interesting dichotomy. You have Stafford, who for a dozen years in Detroit really had very little support. They never won anything. They never hosted a playoff game in his time there. He has all these scars of never getting to this point. Now he's here. Now he has the moment of, of a lifetime does he savor it a little bit more? Is there a little more urgency for him than Burrow, who Burrow just won a national title a couple of years ago at LSU. He comes in, he's, oh, it almost feels easy, right? Like they just think with the arrowhead and they beat Mahomes. They're down 21-3, it's fine, it's no problem. I wonder if there's the same level of, we've got to do this now for the Bengals as there is for a team like the Rams, not only a Stafford who's older, but a guy like Odell Beckham who's been around for a long time, a guy like Jalen Ramsey who's been around, Aaron Donald. I wonder how much urgency uh, the Bengals can muster up to try to match that of the Rams. Yeah, the, I was I was interested by what you you wrote. You said you know the Bengals. To forgive me for paraphrasing, but basically the Bengals had no business being here or didn't know they were going to get here. The Rams needed to get here uh, for some of those points that I think you just outlined. But you know Cincinnati's been adamant throughout the last couple of weeks, at least from the last couple of weeks, at least from everything that I've heard um, that. You know, we're not an underdog. We deserve to be here. You know, they're they're resisting that sort of mentality um, and seemingly gaining confidence with each win. Now they're Super Bowl bound. Um, is there a little bit of of danger in that? Maybe. You know, look, I, I think though I give them a lot of credit. They have the right mentality and they backed up their words with their actions. They were down twenty one three at Kansas City. That game could have gone sideways. They could have lost that game by thirty points easily, and they didn't. They they dug deep they found a way to get it done defensively I mean Burrow's the, the kind of the, the face of it all as most quarterbacks are but it wasn't Burrow on Sunday it was their defense their defense found a way to limit Mahomes 8 of 18 55 yards and two picks in the second half in overtime it was a brutal showing but I do think though what I wrote I, I at least of course believe has some poignancy in the sense that the Bengals were supposed to be dead last in the division this year. They were not supposed to get to this point. Now, does that matter come February 13th? Probably not. The Bengals aren't going to sit there in the locker room and say, well, we don't, you know, we, we shouldn't be here. But I do think there is something to the idea of, of and I say this in a good way, but like young and dumb. You don't know any better because so many of these guys, Jamar Chase is a rookie. Like he hasn't struggled 10 years to get to the Super Bowl. The Rams have so many guys, McVay who's a very young guy, but who has been to the Super Bowl and lost the Super Bowl. Of course, Zach Taylor was his offensive coordinator in that game. I wrote a piece a month ago how close they are. Um, I'm curious to see with Cincinnati, is this a game where early on, do they have the same intensity that the Rams are going to have, especially the Rams being at home, which, which only adds to all the, uh, the intrigue around this game.
Yeah, they say ignorance is bliss, right? But I think once you've been to the Super Bowl, lost it, or you know how hard it is to get to that point when you spent a dozen year in the le- dozen years in the league, like a guy like Matthew Stafford, you realize how finite those opportunities are. And so maybe experience isn't necessarily a blessing, but something of a curse because you know that it's really, really hard to to get to that stage. You just mentioned the the head coaches uh, a lot around the narrative of Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay, and hey, he's got his number and all this stuff. And the piece that you wrote was basically talking about the matchup this week between these two head coaches with Zach Taylor being mentored um, by McVay. What detail that relationship for us and and how interesting this is heading into the Super Bowl uh, between these two friends, really? Yeah, they are. They're very good friends. Uh, they speak often. I, I don't think they'll be speaking a lot probably over the next two weeks, other than maybe a pleasantry or two. But um, I wrote a piece about the Rams and McVay at the very beginning of December, kind of detailing how it seems every time you look at the Rams late in the year, they kind of have this this swoon and sometimes they pull out of it. Sometimes they don't. And I talked to some people who worked on the McVay and Zach Taylor was one of them. We had a, we had a a fairly uh, long conversation and a lot of what we talked about was how much he respects Sean McVay, how much he loves him. I mean, that was a a word that came up a few times and, um, I think for Zach Taylor, it's probably going to make it even more special that he's going to the Super Bowl facing a guy who he has so much admiration for, both personally and professionally. Um, And I know for me, after talking to to Taylor for that period of time, I think it it really is something to watch in this game. Sometimes you'll talk to someone and, and, hey, how how is your relationship with so-and-so? You worked together for five years in a city. And it's it's kind of how, you know, you might be with another coworker. Oh, yeah, it was fine. You know, it was good. You know, it it, it drinks occasionally. Um, this was more than that. Taylor really does genuinely look at McVeigh as somebody uh, almost like it feels like a big brother uh, in, a, in a way. Um, so I think it's fascinating. It also plays into the gameplay, right? Like how well do these guys know each other? How well do they know what the other one wants to do? There's a lot of there's a lot of that at play here. Um, and I, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting chess match to see how much McVeigh can surprise Taylor with and vice versa. Who do you give the edge to early? Um, probably McVay because he's been there. Now, obviously, Taylor is there as an offensive coordinator, but mcveigh has been there as the head guy. It's a totally different deal. You know, when you go, if you ever cover the Super Bowl, you know, the, the, the head coach has so many obligations that whole week. I mean, there's so much to do beyond just the game itself. And I remember I was at, the, I covered that Rams Patriots Super Bowl, and I remember talking to McVay at the podium, and he didn't get a question in. I sat and talked with Zach Taylor for like 15 minutes at a table. Nobody even came up to him. He was just sitting there. And we just started having a conversation and got to know each other a little bit. And, and he just, yeah, all the time in the world. It's different when you're the guy and you're always being asked a question or pulled in a direction. Hey, you got to do this media application. Hey, we need 10 tickets for this guy. Um, I think it's a little bit easier. For, and McVeigh gets to sleep in his own bed every day. I mean, he has the ultimate advantage in that too, right? They don't have to travel. They don't have to worry about any of that stuff. This week's a little different in the sense that normally you have the whole week of media this week or next week, I should say, rather Thursday is when everybody's going to get into town. So it is truncated because of COVID. But I I think it benefits McVeigh just because I think he'll be able to focus completely on the game, whereas I think Taylor is going to have more obligations that he's not used to having. Just back to – the chiefs Bengals game this past weekend, because you mentioned uh, Cincinnati's defense really kind of getting the job done. And to Joe Burrow's credit, uh, he was quick to mention that in the post game interview. Um, But when you think about Patrick Mahomes kind of melting down at the end of that game, how much of that was Cincinnati's defense and how much of that is really on Patrick Mahomes just not being able to execute when it counted? I think it's combination like it usually is, but look, the Bengals, to their credit, in the second half of the game, they dropped eight guys, they spied them, and they basically just said, look, you're not throwing the ball. We're not allowing you to get quick, easy completions. Early in the game, the Chiefs did whatever they wanted. I mean, Mahomes, I believe, in the first half, 18 of 22 for over 200 yards. The Chiefs moved the ball at will. I thought that whole game changed the last play of the first half. Kansas City's up 21 to 10. You're at the one-yard line, no timeouts, five seconds to go. I don't, I don't blame Kansas City for running a play. I blame them for throwing it backwards to the two-yard line and getting tackled and bounced. I mean, all you have to do there is say, look, we're throwing the ball into the end zone quickly, and if it's incomplete, fine. We'll kick a field goal. And if it's not, it's a touchdown, great. I, I thought that threw them completely out of whack. And Mahomes was terrible. He missed some receivers he shouldn't have missed. Um, you know, coverage was tight most of the time. But I really thought it was a failure by the head coach. I thought Andy Reid, look, 
you're, they're dropping eight every play. You got to run the football. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the Chiefs were ripping off six yards of carry in that game. They were killing Cincinnati running the ball. They have one of the better offensive lines in the league. And the Bengals are saying, please, my God, please run the football. Well, we will concede the run. And I really think that was the smart bet and the big bet the Bengals made was that they are not going to be willing to run the football. They will not do it. They're going to continue to throw. They were so successful at it the first half. And if, if that was the bet. They, they cashed in. Um, but Mahomes was terrible. But I also thought the Bengals did a great job with adjustments. And I thought Andy Reid really let his quarterback down by not running the ball more and maybe forcing the Bengals out of that defense a little bit. Yeah, the whole thing felt confusing. And then everybody seemed kind of dazed and confused on Kansas City's side at the end. I mean, there was no – it didn't feel like there was any real – sense of urgency you know and then they win the coin toss and they think that it's just a given that they're going to be able to execute but it almost felt as if things uh just completely fell apart in the second half and you blame andy reed for that i do i i think with the chiefs there's an earned arrogance that they are so talented that it doesn't really matter if they screw up a goal line situation it doesn't really matter if they don't convert on a given drive because they'll just convert on the next drive and I say it's earned because it is earned. They they have been a team that they've won a championship and they've gone to two Super Bowls. And look, there, there's a certain amount of we'll just do it when we need to do it. I thought we saw that in the Buffalo game where, look, that might be one of the greatest games ever. And you watch that game and, you know, people forget because the Chiefs ended up winning. They got a big kickoff, or excuse me, punt return by Tyreek Hill in the fourth quarter of that game. They were up two points at the time, 23-21. It's third and one just outside the 10-yard line. The Chiefs put Blake Bell, their backup tight end under center, and ran an option because they're the Chiefs, and it just works, and they have so much talent. And I, I think sometimes that's what makes them special and what makes them great is they're not afraid to do things that are unconventional. I also think that's a fine line, though, between aggressiveness and recklessness. And in this game, the Chiefs just had to just run the football. I think, they would, I think they'd be sitting in the Super Bowl pretty comfortably if they just run the ball – they didn't. The Bengals executed their defense flawlessly in the second half and in overtime. They're moving on. The Chiefs are sitting there wondering what happened. So on the eve of conference championship Sunday, uh, the NFL world basically went insane because Tom Brady was retiring. Then he wasn't. What is the latest? Are we still in a holding pattern hearing from the quarterback himself until potentially after the Super Bowl? Or what, what do you make of, of what happened on Saturday? Bizarre. And, and I personally was annoyed because I had Saturday off and I, got, I was like, this is great. I get to relax and spend some time with my family. And then I'm at the gym and I see that Adam Schefter's tweeting this out and ran home. And, and then I don't know what, I deleted about 5,000 words. Um, <laughs> not, look, I, I think he's going to retire. I don't think Adam Schefter is necessarily wrong. I think maybe it was phrased a little bit incorrectly. Uh, it made it seem like it was imminent. Whereas I think, look, Brady wants to control the narrative. And I don't blame him. He's played 22 years. He deserves the right to say, look, I'm going to retire on my terms, not by ESPN breaking it. Uh, but in all these things, nobody denied it, right? They don't, you know, his, his agent, Donnie, nobody, nobody said, oh, that's categorically false. He's playing next year. The Buccaneers basically said what they should have said, which is, hey, you know, he's told us he hasn't made a decision. And the agent said, hey, look, we, we don't know yet. Um, but I, I would be, I'd be surprised if he doesn't retire. Look, at 44 years old, I think sometimes people just look at it from a football perspective. But he's also a husband and a father. And I think there's time where it becomes, hey, look, there's more important things in life than trying to win an eighth Super Bowl. I mean, his legacy, whether he wins seven or eight, I think is pretty secure. I think he's good at this point. I think people think he's great. So I think he retires in a few weeks. I think after the Super Bowl, he'll walk. He uh, he seems to be so frustrated anytime um, anything having to do with him or his personal plans or business is leaked or released by anybody else. And I mean, it doesn't really happen that often because his close, close circle, you mentioned his agent, um, his dad, his wife, his mom, you know, that they that's a pretty tight knit circle when it comes to information like retirement. And like you said, with how meticulous he is with producing his own pregame hype videos, um, you know, to think that that he would accidentally leak a retirement or that that would get sloppy, I'm sure is a really frustrating point for him. So I can't think of that many people, a publicist, et cetera, that would would be privy to to that kind of information and be in a position to risk really pissing him off by leaking it. I mean, 
you know, do you get the sense that that Don, his agent or, or somebody that's really, really close to him said, hey, if we get to Darlington or Adam Schefter or one of these power play, you know, writers in the league, we can kind of control this. And, and they're the ones that made the mistake. And he I don't want to say like a too brute, but I mean, to, to be 44 years old and the greatest quarterback of all time and to not be able to make the decision around how you decide to retire to me feels pretty uh it just feels like it kind of sucks, you know, because he, he kind of deserves the right to to do that how he wants to do that. And I'm sure he's really pissed that it happened right before the conference championship game. But I mean, how many people could have really known about how he was thinking and feeling? He's already kind of playfully slapped his dad's wrist for for leaking that kind of information about some thoughts that he had around Bill Belichick. Um, I just can't imagine a lot of people. A lot of people knew about it. No, I agree. I agree, Carolyn. I, I thought it was interesting. You know, I was I was texting a lot that day with a few other reporters in the league, and we were all kind of saying, when you get a story, it's usually from someone in the team, an agent, or the player. And it wasn't from the player. It wasn't from the team. The team came out and vehemently was like, no, 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 he hasn't decided yet. And Don Yee is a veteran agent who's known Tom for a long time. I do not see Don Yee leaking that. I would be <laughs> shocked. So then it, it lends itself to – you know, look, and I, and I have no idea if it was, but was it his trainer? You know, who, I mean, Alex Grove is very well known. I don't know that Alex Grove would do that. They're really close, but maybe, you know, maybe it comes out that way. Um, and I only use Alex just as an example of me, someone in that kind of a circle, that kind of someone maybe close to him, but also is a little bit on the periphery, not a family member, not, not somebody like technically in the NFL. But it makes you wonder. I mean, Adam Schefter to me is above reproach. He's a great reporter. He has been for, for decades. Um, and they, and then when that was tweeted out, it said multiple sources, which makes you think like, if you're going to tweet out that Tom Brady's retiring, like, you better damn well be right. Right. That, you, you can't be, I don't care who you are. You can't be wrong with that. Um, and I, I think he'll end up proven correct, but yeah, I agree. It was weird. I don't know. I feel like it had to be somebody who was kind of maybe in the inner circle, but, but not the typical source that you would have for a story like that. I feel like mm-hmm. it had to come maybe from somebody on the outside, maybe, you know, maybe a financial advisor or maybe, uh, you know, someone who works closely with him. Uh, it's it just, yeah, it was, it was weird. I had the same thought. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we'll wait to, to kind of get confirmation straight from Tom Brady's mouth, but I think that it's probably inevitable. And it's interesting that Joe Burrow has a chance to win a Super Bowl against the Rams. 20 years basically to the day, a little bit after that Tom Brady won his first Super Bowl against the Rams, because I think a lot of people see so much potential in him as this young star quarterback that's really arrived. A couple sort of news and notes things as well before we let you go while we have you here. Um, well, let's stay with quarterbacks. We might as well. And just the very latest on kind of what's going on in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. Do you see him leaving the team? Do you see him staying put? What's your assessment of what's going on there? I think it's going to be the exact opposite of last offseason. I, you know, listen, I get stuff wrong all the time. But last year, I was a, I was a voice saying, I do not think they're going to trade him. I, I just don't see it. Why would you? If you're them, they had all the leverage in the world. They're not moving him. And, and they ultimately played a game of chicken that they won. I think this offseason, I actually think he's going to want to stay, and I think they're going to trade him. Because if you're him, where are you going that you have a better chance to win? Like, I, I keep seeing people say, well, Denver, because Hackett's there now, and he's the OC Green Bay. And look, Denver has a good roster. If he goes there, Denver's going to be really good. Has he seen the AFC? The AFC has Burrow and Allen and Mahomes and Herbert and Lamar Jackson. And by the way, Mahomes and Herbert, if he's in Denver, in his own division. Like, good luck to you in that division, right? I mean, Derek Carr would be the worst guy by a mile. He's the top 12 quarterback in the league. So – I think if you're Rodgers, especially if Brady, let's say Brady retires, you look around that conference. Okay, the Rams are good. Seattle maybe with Wilson, but if he gets moved, who knows? Who else is good? There's no one else in the conference who even remotely scares you. Garoppolo is probably going to get moved. The Niners are going to go on to a different era. If I'm Rodgers, I don't want to go anywhere. Give me Devontae Adams back, and we can go win another 13 games and take a shot at this thing. But I think if you're the Packers – they're going to lose a lot of guys this offseason. They are capped out. They're 40 million plus over. You've got guys like Jair Alexander who are, who are going to be free agents, along with Adams, Robert Tunyon, Devondre Campbell. They're probably going to have to cut Preston and Darius Smith just to get near the cap. And if you're if you're Brian Gutekunst or GM, you might say, we couldn't win the Super Bowl the last two years with this roster. He's a year older. He's still the MVP. I think he'll win again. If you're them, you might say, look, if we get three first round picks for a 39 year old quarterback who's 
kind of sort of had one foot out the door for a while. Let's go ahead and do that and reset this thing and, and build around Jordan Love. And if Jordan Love's not the guy, we just got three extra first round picks. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually wonder if the Packers are more motivated to move on from him than the other way around. Well, I do agree with you. I do think Aaron Rodgers, with how savvy he is, is probably acutely aware that the path to the Super Bowl is a road that's yeah. easier if he stays exactly where he is. The salary cap stuff, in speaking with some Packers insiders, it sounds like they might be able to get a little bit creative. You're right. It is very, very tight. 40 million bucks. It's hard to kind of move that money around. Um, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen there. And I, and the Niners, you know, you bring up Jimmy Garoppolo. It seems like the players really like him and respect him, but you really saw key mistakes this weekend. Um, and you, you saw his inadequacies, I think. So you're of the thinking that the 49ers are probably going to try to start this next era. I mean, it was a, a really fun, nice run while it lasted. And I give him a lot of credit for playing through injury and trying to galvanize the locker room and was very close to making it to the Super Bowl. But you think that that, that chapter is closed in San Francisco now. I, I think it's over there. And, and look, Jimmy Garoppolo is a weird guy in the sense there. I vastly, whether he's underrated or overrated, basically on a drive by drive basis, depending on how he looks. Um, but I think in the end, he's about an average quarterback in the NFL. It's about where he lands. He's not bad. He's not he's not great. Uh, you, you can certainly win with him. He's proven that. But if you're the Niners and you traded three first round picks for Trey Lance, Trey Lance is playing. And unlike Rodgers, who was, who was obviously a great player and who had multiple years left on his deal, this is the last year of Garoppolo's deal. He's not an elite player. And if you're the Niners and you don't trade him this year, you play this thing out, you're losing him for nothing. You're losing him for a comp pick. So I think after trading all that draft capital, you need to recoup some of that by trading him. When You're not going to get multiple firsts for him, but maybe you get one first. Maybe you get – two twos and, and, and another pick down the line. That's something. And with Trey Lance coming in, look, you, you traded all that for him. You think he's an elite player, or at least that he's going to be. If you don't feel that way, then that trade's a disaster. So you bring him up, you let him play. If he becomes the star you think he's going to be, then you're better off and you're getting capital for Garoppolo. And again, if he's not the guy – kind of like I said, where Jordan Love, at least you have draft capital then to go, all right, well, maybe we can either build around him to make the team palatable for a few years or go get another guy. I, I would be shocked if Barack goes back in 2022. Has Jordan Love already, unfortunately, done enough to cast real doubt over whether or not he has the ability to be elite? I mean, you feel bad for the guy getting just a couple of opportunities to step into a guy like Aaron Rodgers' shoes and experiences everything, but – when you think about a, a player like Trey Lance and then you think about a player like Jordan Love, I, I think if uh, perception is reality, a lot of people really are not sold that Jordan Love could be the guy in Green Bay. It's interesting. I mean, Jordan Love's only played one meaningful game in the NFL, and that was when Rodgers missed uh, the game against the Chiefs this year with COVID. And, and Love struggled mightily. The game is one would expect. He's going to Arrowhead against a pretty good team uh, that at the time was playing great defensive ball. I, I think this. You haven't heard anybody say, man, love looks great. Love looks special. Love, you know, I mean, that, that doesn't always mean anything. I remember when Herbert got drafted and everybody was talking about how oh, it was such a reach and we haven't seen it in the preseason. Then he comes out and he's just unbelievable. But, yeah, I think it's fair to say there's some doubt. I mean, you're sitting for two years on the bench. And when he came out of Utah State, there was a lot of doubt then whether he was worthy of the first-round pick. You know, it wasn't like he was a slam-dunk pick that everybody felt, oh, he's top ten. You know, I remember talking to some people who thought he was worth the first round grade. I talked to some people who didn't think he was a top 50 player in the draft. So we, we'll see. But if you're the Packers, you drafted him in the first round. You've got to, you've got to find out, I think. And, and, I, and I think they're going to sooner rather than later. Yeah, feet to the fire, maybe the only way. And you're right. I mean, one game, geez. I mean, you talk about expectations and pressure. It's really not fair to assess a kid after just, you know, one nerve-wracking performance. Um, just before I let you go, let's talk a little bit about the head coaching puzzle. You know, a number of different vacancies. Is it taking longer than you expected for for some of those positions to be filled? I mean, we, we saw um, the Giants now have their guy. But, you know, what do you make of, of the search process, I guess, for the remaining spots? Yeah, you know, I am. I am surprised. I wrote a week ago in Stack the Box that I thought by the time we hit Mobile here that just about all these vacancies would be filled. That's usually the cutoff point, the dividing line for these teams because they don't want to come here with 
incomplete staffs and not really knowing what they're what they're aiming for in terms of okay we've had these meetings and we know these are the areas we've identified that we want to scout heavily um but you're right i mean you look jacksonville it feels like jacksonville's had an opening for what now a, a month and a half they don't seem any closer to figuring it out six weeks later than they were the day they fired urban meyer they have no direction um the raiders finally hired josh mcdaniel so that's that's now done they're one team you can check off but yeah the dolphins you know, they, they kind of surprisingly fired Brian Flores, and it seems like maybe Mike McDaniel's the guy there. We'll see. Um, but that's no sure thing. You'll get Flores himself. Where is he going to land? Is he going to land in Houston? Is he going to go somewhere else? Uh, you know, the Texans, they've been sitting there. It's been a quiet search. Uh, and then Minnesota, there's talk now Jim Harbaugh. You know, maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? I've been, I've been very surprised at how long it's taken these teams. But I also wonder – you know, a lot of times you hear about these really hot coaching candidates. You know, for years it always felt like the enemy was one of the guys who never ended up getting a job. Or it was, you know, Dable last year, who was a real hot name this year, of course, gets a job. I feel like this year, once Kellen Moore was like, I'm not leaving Dallas, it, it, there's not a lot of names that people are really clamoring for. And so it maybe it's just taken a little while as teams are trying to figure out who that right guy is. But it, it definitely has been a longer process than in past years. Is it um, – and I don't really know the answer to this. I, this just is just something that occurred to me. So if you if you don't know, that's okay too. But what, what is the percentage in the league of offensive coordinators that have a significant amount of responsibility? I mean, is it a question of there not being enough well-developed candidates inside the league? Because it really does seem like there is a finite number of great head coaches. And so if these vacancies are, are being filled with, you know, lesser than stellar – candidates or not being filled you know in a timely fashion is that is that because it's hard to to get that kind of experience or what do you think it is it's an interesting point i I mean if you look at who's been hired mcdaniels is an offensive coach coming from a defensive head coach right everflus going to chicago he's a defensive coordinator under frank Reich, who's an offensive mind dable same kind of thing offensive mind coming from a defensive head coach so i think I think there's truth in that. I think it's one of the biggest reasons the enemy hasn't gotten a job. I just mentioned him. I I think most people think it's Andy Reid's offense. And it is now. Didn't hurt Matt Nagy. Didn't hurt uh, Doug Peterson. But I think there's a little bit to that. Um, I think one of the bigger problems right now in the league is when you look around, Flores notwithstanding, because he has has a lot of respect around the league. But there are these other names, you know, we've heard Kevin O'Connell come up, Mike McDaniel, who I mentioned. Do I think people do think highly of in the league, but it almost feels like maybe a year too soon, but who else is out there? You know, you're, the Urban Meyer thing, I think, killed college coaches coming in for a little while. And then you know, that that's always kind of a, of a subject that is hotly debated in the NFL anyway. And then that happened. And I think teams are like, okay, maybe not for a little bit. That, Chip Kelly, we've had some recent failures. Um but I, I do just think a lot of it is it's just a cycle. There aren't a lot of guys you look at and see that teams are like, a, like I remember when Matt Rule came in and it felt like there were like four teams that really wanted him. And he ends up getting this huge contract from Carolina. There's not that guy this year. There's not that guy. That, I think Dable maybe is the closest thing to it. But now that he's signed on, I look at Flores as kind of the next domino to fall. We'll see. It's, it's been slow and coming. Yeah, I saw that you wrote that the Giants made it very clear that they're not interested in Deshaun Watson. And, you know, Merrick came out and said, like, hey, we we like our quarterback. We're going to give him a chance. We've put him through it, that sort of a thing. And then Dable has been given a lot of credit for the development of Josh Allen. I mean, is that is that the goal, hopefully, in, in Giants ownership's mind that, hey, this is a guy that really um, is offensive minded, that can mold a quarterback. And we need, you know, we desperately need that. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think they brought in Dable feeling like, look, we drafted Kadarius Tony in the first round last year. And we signed Kenny Galladay to a big money contract. And he caught zero touchdowns. And Kadarius Tony was underwhelming. And we have Saquon Barkley. Like, there are weapons on the Giants. Now, the offensive line has been a struggle. But they need to get Daniel Jones to play the best of his abilities. Like, if Daniel Jones doesn't play well, the rest of this is academic. It doesn't matter. And so I think they're looking at this going, Daniel Jones is on a one-year audition. If he plays well and Dable likes him, great. We, we move forward. If he doesn't, then we move forward a different direction. But, you know, Mara talked openly about, hey, we've done everything we can to screw this kid up. 
This has been a disaster from day one. We've got to figure it out. Well, Dable's the guy. I mean, you mentioned it. Josh Allen, his first two years in the NFL was not good. And Dable really got into play. And credit to Allen, too, who stepped up and played excellent football. But Dable gave him a system where he thrived in. And if he can't get Jones to succeed, I think there's going to be a feeling among people in the NFL like, well, then it's just not going to happen. I mean, this, this is his opportunity. So, yes, I think a huge part of the reason they brought in Dable was they need to get the quarterback position right. And, and he should be the guy who can do it one way or the other. All right, one last one for you, and then I promise I'll let you go as you uh, scout the quarterbacks of the future. Uh, do you think that Jerry Jones is satisfied with the pieces that he has in Dallas? And I'm talking top to bottom. I think Jerry Jones is already thinking about how much he's going to pay Sean Payton. <laughs> and that's what I think. Because if you're around the NFL, Sean Payton and Jerry Jones are about as tight as tight can be. And – Mike McCarthy did not perform up to expectations in the playoffs when they led the league in penalties and then backed it up with 14 of them. Owners will lose and they'll live with it sometimes, depending on who the owner is. They will not be embarrassed and live with it. Dallas got embarrassed in that game because of how poorly they played with the penalties and then the end of the game situation, which was just a comical disaster. I think if Mike McCarthy doesn't go to the NFC title game, he will be one and done in terms of next year. And Sean Payton is going to be coming on down. Now they're going to have to give up compensation. But I think their roster, I think Jerry Jones is pretty happy with the roster, not to say they can't improve here or there. And they're going to lose some guys this offseason. They have a lot of free agents. They have not a lot of money to spend to keep those guys. But I don't think he's upset with the roster. He loves Dak. Um, and, and obviously that's the most important part of any roster in the NFL. But I definitely think – if McCarthy doesn't have a huge year next year, whatever the, the Saints, whatever they want, they're getting from Dallas. And Sean Payton is going to be wearing the star again. All right, Matt, thank you so much for the time. I know I kept you way longer than I probably should have. Appreciate it. Um, and then just one more time for everybody, Stacking the Box, the podcast. You find it anywhere you can get pods or where should we find you? You can find it anywhere. You get a podcast, a YouTube channel as well, Stack in the Box. You can subscribe to it every Tuesday. We're on there live, although this Tuesday I will not be at Dan Mobile. But the pod will go live. We'll have uh, a guest on there as well. So, I think um, you had Joe Montana. Did you have Joe Montana on, on the last episode? Uh, not on the last one, but we've had him. Um, we've had him. We're gonna, I, I believe we're going to have Jerry Rice here in, in a little bit. Uh, we've got, we have, we have Derek Henry. We've got Juju Schmidt-Schuster multiple times this season. Oh, amazing. Um, you know, we – We've had we've had quite a few uh, notable guests, and we had Dick, Dick Budkiss, who, by the way, is now like the best follow on Twitter that there is. <laughs> he's, an, he's an amazing follow. Um, so yeah, it, it's a national NFL podcast. We try to cover the whole league, and um, yeah, you know, we mix a little gambling in there as well too. If you like that sort of thing. All so, right. Well, you sold me, and congrats on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, thank you very much. Best of luck to you. Uh, you're probably going to be staying warmer than I am up here in New York, but um, thanks for being with us, and hope to talk to you again soon, maybe after the Super Bowl. Absolutely, anytime.